If, uh, I think some of you guys were here in December, but I gave a talk in December about uh, programming languages. It got, uh, it got a little bit controversial, opinionated, and I remember at the, at the end of the talk, um, we were talking after beers and somebody told me, like, okay, can you make this even more controversial? <laughs> so, I, so I was like, okay, I, I thought about this and I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to cover every single freaking, like, every single JVI, JVM item that I've heard that, like, turn into a flame war. Uh, and go over it, um, but but really, there's a li there's going to be a little bigger picture that I want to dive into. Um, and does anyone recognize the picture on the left? Oh yeah, you guys you guys will see what I'm getting at. So uh, background, um, I work at Pivotal right now as a platform architect. So obviously, I have biases. Spring Spring Boot, yay, and PCF, uh, awesome products. I worked at ThoughtWorks for five years, doing a lot of consulting. A lot of my experience has been in like big corporate worlds, uh, banks, uh, all over North America, uh, fixing a lot of messes. So like I've done a lot of day two, like oh here's a mess, here's a mess, here's a mess, like fix it, fix it, fix it. Uh, I, I feel like I have a little bit of a different uh, experience. Um, like I, the, like I come from like that background. Uh, caveats. So this, there's going to be some opinions in here. Uh, none, of, none of them reflect my company or my company's, <laughs> my company's opinions. They're all strictly mine. Uh, there is like a bigger picture at the end of the day, look, um, and I'll get into it. I, I don't think any of them, uh, any of these texts are good or bad. It's all about uh, context. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, who here has been in a flame war? Like, uh, like really... Or, or like who here, I, I actually enjoy like looking at the stuff on Stack Overflow where people get like really opinionated and like almost screaming at each other. Uh, but I, I, I've, I've kind of seen a pattern where usually it starts off with kind of the talking parrot fa uh, phase. And if uh, anyone has seen like the Mongo, uh, I think it's the Mongo, Mongo's web scale video on YouTube, highly recommend it. Uh, but that's usually where things start off of where you kind of get this like this repeat of the same buzzwords. Uh, oh, and uh, it's got electrolytes. I was watching Idiocracy a couple of weeks ago, and like, I was like, oh, yeah, it, electrolytes. We should like drink Gatorade because it has electrolytes. And, and that's the entire argument, or it's web scale. And it's, it's not to say that these aren't like, there isn't some merit in electrolytes or web scale or, uh, I don't know, uh, loose coupling or immutable types. It's not that there there's, isn't some merit, it's just being stuck on this buzzwords and not really connecting the dots out. Uh, then you usually go up to the Google lookup phase of you type in X, why X is better than Y, and of course you're gonna get answers. And then like all the, you're, you're also gonna find answers of why like why Y sucks or why like all the points of why Y is better than X are actually invalid. So you're just going to pick all your facts. Y vaccine. Pardon me? Y vaccine's called Watson. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you get there. And then, and then you get this emotional breakdown phase of X sucks, Y is evil, name calling. And if you're really lucky, and I have seen this happen, uh, you get Goodwin's Law, which is uh, Goodwin's Law is where somebody calls somebody else a Nazi. And I have seen that happen. Uh, and I think if, if I was to summarize this entire talk and like the entire problem of this in one slide, it would be the South Park uh, underpants episode um, where it was, it was a clap, classic episode. It's actually, I think it was from season two where these, these gnomes, these magical gnomes had these underpants or collecting underpants. They were set on collecting underpants and then phase three was profit. So I mean, phase one was collect underpants. Phase two, I don't know. Phase three, profit. I mean, their profit was irrelevant. Phase two was irrelevant. They were just set on collect underpants and extrapolated out. And this is exactly what I see with uh, technology choices, where people just get stuck. They get stuck on whatever microservices, Kubernetes, colon, whatever. I'm not saying any of these are bad inherently. I actually think all of them are pretty good and they have their points. But where I see things break down is people start from the left side. And then they just ignore all the facts that work against them. They really want to use that thing. And they're like, yeah, phase three, profit. We profit. If we, if we have more web scale, 
if you have more Kubernetes, profit. Um, my argument is we need to start thinking the other way around and like pick whatever you want. Uh, I randomly picked Kotlin. I actually, I'll get into that too. Um, but figure out from phase three, whatever, like whatever at that time makes sense to pick. I love shiny objects. I'm always going to pick cool tools, but pick the right one. Um, so kind of stepping back, like stepping back from profit, um, kind of the three things, and I think these are independent of programming. This is like in general, like any type of conversations you get into, like whether it's like politics or programming, I, I think there's like three level sets that I feel like a lot of people miss is uh, like number one is uh, economics 101. Your needs are infinite. Like if I was to summarize, like I studied economics and if I summarize economics in one sentence, it's your needs are infinite, your resources are finite. Like nobody's saying that like, you know, uh, optimizing this uh, isn't good. Yeah, maybe it's good, but like is that the best usage of your time right now? Like maybe, maybe it's better and more efficient if you actually just add an extra feature instead of trying to like fine tune the extra 1% of performance and maybe adding like inline assembly and byte shifting, whatever. Maybe you should just be adding features. So it's like no, no one's saying that things are bad. It's like, okay, what a, is this the best usage of my time right now? Um, probability 101 or statistics 101, I didn't know what the right name for this, but this is where I get stuck if, um, I, uh, you, you could explain to someone um, why something was bad, you could back them up with proof, and I find where I, where I waste a lot of time is then they tell me that, oh, well, that one case, it actually worked for me. And I like, uh, the one example that I like to use is you could s explain to somebody that smokes that, like, look, cancer's bad, here are the stats. Uh, it's going to greatly improve your chances of cancer. And they're going to say, well, my old grandmother back in the day didn't get cancer and lived until 80, so I'm going to keep smoking. I, I get that all the time of programming, like these rules of thumbs, they're going to have exceptions, but just stick to the defaults instead of thinking that, oh, just because it worked for you once somewhere back in the day, like just stick to the default or whatever's the sen uh, sensible default instead of um, picking whatever you want. And then human nature 101, I kind of feel like I, I used to think that developers, because we come from like math and like logic, that we're one, like we're like the most logical profession, and we make rational choices. But now I'm convinced that we're like the most ir illogical group of like professional people, and we make horrible decisions. And there's a couple of things like self-interest. Uh, number one, uh, super prevalent. Uh, I know I've been guilty of this too, where you're stuck on a project, maybe you're not getting paid the most, you think you're underpaid. So you're like, eh, you know what, I'm getting paid, whatever, $100,000 regardless. Maybe I should pad my resume a little bit and uh, add some nice little hype, hype words on my resume and get, like, get some Kubernetes experience on my resume because that's really, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, identity is a great one. I, f I find like the more invested, it, it's almost like politics or religion, the more investment you have in something, the more you're going to be, um, the more you're, the more you're going to defend it, no matter what. Uh, biases, I mean, like we all have, like it's a like human nature one on one. We all have them. B like these biases of like we make ir ir illogical choices for whatever reason. It's in our genes, I, and one of them is obviously shiny objects. Uh, I mean, that's why we love. Like that's that's why you buy brand new cars, even though we know we. You drive it off the lot, and it's going to lose 20% of the value. And to be fair, I bought, a, I bought a brand new car two years ago, so I'm just as guilty of this bias as possible. Uh, and the last one that I kind of wanted to dig into is this Dreyfus model of um, skill acquisition. And I have a, a diagram next. Um, is s Some smart guy did this, and I found it on Wikipedia. But it's this observation that when you're at a no novice, beginner, and competent level, you need like these rules and you need to be told exactly what to do. They need to be specific. And then when you get into proficient and expert, you kind of think really big picture. And m my example with cooking is like, I love cooking, but I'm like a beginner competent. And I need to be told exactly like how many milliliters of everything to, to put in. And it drives me up the wall when 
I'm going through a cookbook and somebody says, like, add X to taste. It's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what taste is. Like, tell me exactly how much to put in. And then on the flip side, uh, like something like unit testing, I, I think, I, I, I feel like the number that always gets thrown out is 80%, like have 80% unit test coverage. And I think what happened there is somebody, because I'm tired of getting asked about this too, of like how much should I do testing? I feel what happened was somebody at the more proficient expert level was like, they kept getting asked and they were like, okay, well, it depends on this and depends on that and depends on that. And then eventually they got tired from being asked from novices and beginners. And they're like, okay, well, just test 80%. 80% test coverage, <laughs> just test 80%. It's good enough. Uh, so it's that. Uh, kind of lower level, a couple of observations that I've made um, that, I, that kind of before we get into like these controversies that I kind of want to align on. I, I think with different uh, markets, it could change a little bit between startups and corporate. Uh, or if you have like maybe game development. Uh, but in general, the trends that I've seen is uh, there's, there's definitely been a, this higher level trend of development of programming languages, of infrastructure, and that's definitely been a key driver in velocity. So, I mean, we don't program in assembly many, anymore. We, we program in Java, where it's, really, where it's really getting closer to this business value. Like, being closer to describing what you're actually able to, what you want to solve from a business value point of view instead of fiddling with the details. So I know in December when I talked about programming languages and kind of the trend, like we don't, most people don't program in assembly anymore. And there's a lot of like low level details. You got to worry about registers. You got to, uh, like in C++, you got to manage your memory. You got to remember to free it. There's been this trend upwards to getting closer to this business value in English. Uh, what else? Uh, this one, I feel like a lot of developers miss this. Um, and I know there's, there's been a lot of studies, I think in the Just Humble DevOps, uh, sorry, Continuous Delivery book, they talk a little bit about the stats behind this. Um, there's another great book I was reading about fallacies of software development. They also talk about this. But the majority of your time is going to be spent in maintenance in day two, not like the getting the product out the door version one. Um, and this cost is directly proportional to the amount of like moving pieces and lines of code. And also, the average developer job length is two years, uh, plus or minus. But it's short. So you typically, I find like you have these developers, they hack things together, and then uh, you know, you get into day two, and then things like, oh, this is difficult to maintain, and they leave. Uh, what else? Uh, what? Uh, eliminate waste. Um, this kind of go goes back to economics. This is what I usually try to, like, push people towards. Like, adding, like, when you're not working on tangible business value, sure, like, unit tests aren't adding value at the end of the day from, like, what the business wants. Um, but sure, maybe at the, they help you in one ways. But the one thing they want to emphasize is like, be wary that like any type of performance optimizations, anything that you're adding that's maybe not a new feature, it's time not actually spent adding business features. Not, not to say that it's not, doesn't have its own benefit, but just something that th this opportunity cost from economics that everyone needs to be aware of. Uh, everything is a trade-off. Uh, specifically, the main one that I see a lot is hardware cost versus human cost. You could optimize. You could optimize your code up the wazoo. Um, but that's time spent like either not adding business value or that's extra development, development time that you, need to, um, that you need to spend money on. And especially if you look at the last 20 years, I mean, like hard, hardware costs have just been dropping and dropping and dropping. Uh, what's, the, what's that law that hardware, pardon me? Moore's Law, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, I know it's kind of slowed down a little bit recently, but I mean, at the end of the day, like, cost per CPU usage just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, and you have the, all these awesome tools. Human costs, I would say, have been kind of the staying the same, if not going up a little bit more. So, I mean, if you get into this, uh, I've been sucked into a lot of conversations where people, people want to spend, like, two months to, like, fine-tune an extra percent of performance, and then if you look at, like, how much money it's saving the company, it's like, okay, well, you know, it's like 
you're saving the company $10 a month. Uh, it's a waste. And also flexibility. Like people talk about flexibility. Um, flexibility is cost. If you want to make things extensible, um, it's a cost. If you want to make, it, and it's just something to be wary of. Metrics are important. Uh, change is certain. Even, like, sorry, just to, even flexibility where you don't need it is a cost yeah. because somebody has to make a decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, where do we put this knob? Uh, yep. There's only one valid setting, but we have 17 to choose from. It uh, doesn't even count the cost of building it. Oh, yeah, and then you have like meetings of like deciding all the stuff. It's, yeah. yep. Uh, change is certain. Um, whether it's like your initial requirements are going to change, your developers are going to change, technology is going to change, everything's going to change. Like, that's certain. It's just like death and taxes. Uh, so what I kind of see, and, and I think it's pretty well understood in the practices uh, in the industry, like this XP style of programming of just get your features, like really reduce your cycle time, get things out the door so you can prove them out, and so those features could start delivering value. And then if you need to optimize, like optimize. Um, uh, developer decisions, kind of some decisions that kind of feed my choices. Um, what are startups doing? I find startups are typically need to be a lot more leaner than corporate. Corporate can have waste. I find like startups usually are a lot better at like really picking the best technologies of uh, like what's going to drive performance and what's going to drive uh, business value. Obviously, like this is this is this is one of those in general cases. Uh, same with the giants. Like what, what's Netflix doing? What, what's Facebook Facebook doing? Apple, whatever. Actually, I don't think anyone knows what Apple's actually doing. They don't really document anything. But like, what are like, Netflix has solved a lot of great problems. Uh, so just look at what they're doing. And I'm gonna I put in two stars, which I'm gonna get into. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, a lot of these companies are years ahead of what corporates into. Like, just take advantage of all the lessons that they've learned and like, uh, use them. Uh, market trends in hiring. I will say that like hiring is important. Like if you have, uh, if you have a market that I don't know has a lot of C sharp developers, yeah, like there's nothing wrong. Like factor the, these bigger things into account. Of is is it going to be easy to hire this this person? Uh, what's the market trend? Stack Overflow has a lot of good statistics on language trends or platform <laughs> trends, and and Google Trends too. You could actually compare like you type in two words into Google Trends, and it'll compare them. Um, and then the other one, th well, the one that really annoys me is like people will get very uh, uh, opinionated on something, but they completely ignore the, pr the, the cons and the costs. So just like be transparent. If there's something that you're picking, um, like just be transparent about the costs, uh, which I'll get into. Oh, yeah, and actually, yeah, the, the star star for the giants, what the giants are doing. Uh, just keep in mind that you're not, no one is operating at Netflix or Google scale. Like no one. Maybe Facebook. 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 Facebook, Google, pardon me? I would say Yeah. Yeah, st start yeah, this is why like, this is why I'm focusing a bit more corporate. Startup is different because I find like you could, you, you really have to like get your version one out the door and you could really just hack it and then go version two. And hopefully get financing. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean it's all about just getting value out the door and just hack the shit out of it. And then worry about like yeah. code quality and yeah. re rewriting everything from scratch. So this this is why the focus is a little bit more on corporate. Yeah. It's a different class of problems. It's like the other Uh this one, so I'm gonna start off with easy stuff, uh, constructor dependency dependency injection versus uh the alternative setter or field. Uh what do you guys think? Constructor? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who cares, actually? Uh, okay, so I mean, I mean th this, this argument, and I, man, you, uh, you beat me to the punch. Damn it. Okay, so there's, there's different ways of doing this, right? If you Google it, you can find answers for everything. The constructor one is typically the one that people are the most vocal about. Uh, Spring 5 added this required, required annotation, which is kind of nice for uh, setters, where you could just, instead of doing constructor, you could add it on your setter. Um, is code more readable with constructor dependency injection? I would say no, because you get into these big giant constructors. Like I personally, I, I think constructors are like, they're not, 
they're not adding business value. It's almost the same as getters and setters and why languages are kind of going away from getters and setters. And you yeah, usually but yeah, this is why in corporate, corporate like banks usually like, or sorry, uh, corporate, uh, you're usually going to have like messy code. Uh, <laughs> more readable, better, better for testing. Eh, I don't know, less error prone. In some ways, yes, because if if you don't have the right dependency and constructor depend, uh, constructor um, dependency injection, it's not there. But then in other ways, I find like when you have like these big giant constructors, and especially if some of them are the same type, it's really easy in your tests to like flip them. And then you have these tests where like, look, I only care about this thing. Like I only want to say like, oh, test this, uh, sorry, test this and like set uh, this dependency to that. But now you got to like define your entire constructor. And then sometimes it's really easy to flip it out of order, uh, which is why and it, I know a lot of all modern languages, Swift, Kotlin, uh, geez, even Groovy does this, where if you um, either they force you to do it or they let you to do it, where if you have multiple parameters, you have to explicitly specify the name, um, which is why like Java still doesn't let you do that. Uh, so I don't know. But at the end of the day, like th this one is just a waste of time, like discussing and because I have spent. Uh, like I, I have had, I've spent numerous hours, way too much hours debating with people about this during work time when we could have been, when we could have been working on functionality on like which one to use, should we use this one, should we use this one. This is kind of the first point that I wanted to get to is this, this bike shedding concept. Oops. Uh, for, for whatever reason, especially when you're on the like more junior beginner competent level, I found people always waste their time depending uh, sorry, debating on the useless and easy stuff. Uh, th there's a story behind bike shedding. Look it up on the Wikipedia. But I find people I always. Who coined that phrase? Yeah. If you want to hear about it, I, we can talk about it. But yeah, I, I, I agree. This when, is. When you use I would say use field, use field injection. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just stop, stop, stop. Uh, it's, I look, as a, as a what, okay, if you're, a, if, I, I would say if you're a tech lead, because uh, this is like a tabs versus spaces, yep. you, what you got to do is you got to like cut the bullshit like debates and like, okay, let's have a meeting, let's debate this. Just be like, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm the tech lead, this is the way we're doing it. We could draw straws or we could like pull things out of a hat, I don't care. We're deciding on one way, that's the way we're doing it. I think the value is like so, like, it's, it's marginal either way, and if you force me to debate one or the other, I could debate like I could debate any of them, it's and I could. It's easier than that. Like just do the one that works. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if, you have like if, you, if you spend an hour with two two people with a two-person team debating this, yeah. you have exceeded the value yeah. of the thing that you're debating. This is. A, but, if it's working, but if you have to use field injection, but anyways, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Uh, but okay, this is what I demo because this, this is real code. This is what I mean about this constructor stuff. And I didn't just like ran, That's like I was, this is a code smell. smell. But this is why I'm talking about corporate. Like I'm talking about uh, a large the, 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 actually, and this is a, this I was digging into because uh, I was looking into uh, dockerizing um, uh, using, using on demand agents for Jenkins the other day. Some side project I'm working on. And this is like, this is like Jenkins code of like, I don't know good stuff, but I mean, these are constructors. And like, imagine writing this stuff in a test. Uh, it's going to get really hard. Like, this is why I prefer, like, just define my variables. But again, just like I was saying with the, the field stuff, like, move on, Scala. <laughs> I, I, counted, I counted three people that I might piss off again. Uh, <laughs> but look, OK, at the end of the day, I think we we're all in agreement it's more succinct than Java. The, in general, I, like, especially when you go into getters and setters, I find it's less lines of code. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like the focus that I typically f feel people push on is like this focus on performance, this focus on concurrency. It is a steep learning curve. Uh, it is very high investment. Um, and I find it's not so much the language, but it's also everything else that comes with it. Because you usually, OK, you probably, you're probably not going to use Maven. You're going to use SVT. You're probably going to use Acker and Actors and Play and et cetera. And it's really about like not just the, the language, but this entire ecosystem. And it is very steep. Uh, yeah, and then like, 
backwards compatibility. Oh, every so often you upgrade to a new version and oops, uh, sorry, you can't use the old uh, binaries that are compiled to another version. Uh, IDE support, it's actually, to be fair, it's been a while since I used Scala, but I know last time I used it, the IDE support sucked. Oh, it's, it's not approved. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eclipse support is still yeah. fucking awful. And I don't, know how, I don't know if build times have improved. Um, uh, they have, sort of. Yeah. Uh, uh, like to be so, Scala guy. Compatibility <laughs> has also improved yeah. in that they provided tooling to assist in that forward transition. Yeah. It is still a difference. I, I there's yeah. no question. So, so to give a background for Java developers, so like imagine coding and. You, get, you upgrade to Java 1.8, and then you see, oh, geez, all these binaries I use in 1.7, I can't use them anymore. And my G1.7 code won't compile anymore. And so the guy has to go back and compile. Yeah. I would say that the main danger that I found with Scala is the fact that there's too much magic. Yeah. So you're Performance actually, to, from my point of view, as as a Scala developer, if you're using Scala in order to gain performance, you're, you're going down the wrong path. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, thank you for hitting my my, no, my next are, point. You're like, no, I, I not agree. The reason to use Scala. Um, there are good reasons yeah. to use Scala. There are bad reasons to use Scala. There are yeah. really awful things about Scala. Performance is not a good reason to use Scala. Yep. Um, Flat out. So yeah, so the, those do hit on my next two items. The market trend that I'm observing, and I t talked about it on uh, in December. I mean, you look at what LinkedIn and Yammer and uh, what are the like Twitter are doing. They're, they're doubling down on Java and be like, nah, you know what, the Scala thing, maybe it's too much. You look at the Google Trends or Stack Overflow. It's, I'm sorry, it's going down. It's, uh, and the same with performance. I mean, like the the amount of rhetoric or like silly words. Uh, the, I kid you guys not, one of the reasons that I found why you should uh, use Scala online yesterday on Stack Overflow, Google it and you'll find it. And somebody was saying, you should use Scala because your AWS cost will be cut by 90%. I'm like, no, like, no, that's, if you, if you need to use it, look, at the end of the day, just justify it with metrics. It's kind of what I was saying last time, maybe with big data, Hadoop, t that, that type of stuff. But like factor all the stuff in, like it is a very steep learning curve. Uh, it is a very non-standard stack. Um, it is very hard to hire good Scala developers. There's like different ways of doing it. Like there, you could do idiomatic Scala, you could do like performance Scala. There's some very serious costs. Uh, if your team members are trying to convince you to use them, like make sure you have reasons. And like one valid reason is like, well, we have five Scala developers on our team and they're gonna quit if we don't do Scala. Well, okay, well, I'll probably factor that in. And two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, there's reasons. So this is why, like, I, I want to get away from this whole good and bad because it's not. Uh, what, what do you mean by non-standard stack? Spring is not standard. Like, not JVM. Oh. Okay, your your average Java developer is going to use Spring. He's going to use Maven or Gradle. He's going to use like standard synchronous calling. Yeah, not by the technical definition. Yeah. Okay, th there's no like, okay, it's not like a professional standard, but what I mean is like, in general, your average developer in the JVM ecosystem is not gonna know SBT ACA actors play. They're gonna know Maven or Gradle, they're gonna know uh, Spring MVC, they're gonna know synchronous style programming, they're gonna know Spring MVC. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that. Right. And it's very interesting, and there's a use case for it, and I've been using it, but it needs to be justified up the wazoo. Yes. It is not Damn standard. It is Every in the familiarity. Everyone's the beating me to the punchlines here. Jeez. So <laughs> uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna go faster. So this is actually uh, Google Trends. I love using Google Trends. Uh, I looked up Google uh, Aka on Spring Boot, and if you notice, the Aka one's going down. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Kotlin, you guys, you guys, you guys are going to be surprised. Even you Scala guys are going to, you, you're going to be surprised of what I'm going to say. I love Kotlin. It's more succinct than Java. 
I find in general the focus is on developer productivity. Uh, it has this true knowledge of safety. And it's not this optional crap that I'm not going to get into. Uh, lower learning curve. Uh, pardon my French or whatever. Lower learning curve, lower investment. It is, it is easier to learn. Like it took me a lot less time to figure out Kotlin than it's Scala. I'm still trying to figure out Scala. Uh, it works well with the Java ecosystem. Uh, I mean, like it's built by JetBrains. Like the ID is awesome, backwards compatible, all that. Generally, you're going to get uh, positive developer productivity improvements. The market trend I'm seeing is positive. I mean, like especially for what you see with what's going on with co like uh, sorry, especially in the Android space, it's positive. But uh, I would argue, like, is it really worth investing in it? Because especially in the corporate world, I find there's this concept of political capital, where. Uh, uh, like CEOs and like directors, they want to hear everyone changing things all the time. Like, oh, great, another tech, another tech, or another technology. I don't know if Kotlin is the right one and the biggest return on investment. And actually, another example that I want to drop is um, like, is there anyone ever heard of the the language? And actually, not programming language, spoken language Esperanto. Yeah, so I mean, it's the same con like uh, Esperanto. It's like this artificial language that people speak, and I think I think there's actually a million speakers in the world. When you look into the details, I'm like, and you compare it with English, you're like, oh my gosh, English is horrible. Like it's a horrible language. It makes no sense. There's no rules. Esperanto is beautiful. Why don't people use Esperanto? Uh, I just I feel like it's not. It's just diminishing returns. It's like good enough. Like there's other things we should fix. Sure, maybe like a startup you space Android, I'd consider it. But if you're working at a bigger company and you only have like, you could only inject X amount of new technologies every couple of months, I don't know if Kotlin's the one, even though I'm a huge like Kotlin fanboy. Uh, dynamic typing, this, this one's fun. Uh, less code, right? I think we could all agree that it's less code. In general, it's less code. Well, no, no. I'm, oh, okay, I'm gonna get into. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get into the. Co there is a statement. Jeez. These guys read my slides. Okay, I'll get. I'll get. Okay, I'll get into this. Uh, I'll get into the testing. Uh, there is a line for testing. You guys wrote my read my slides, didn't you? Uh, but I, but I will say the definition. The I find the definition. People look at, like look at the definition of like they get into like the hard low level definition of like. Uh, Oh well, it's the compiler or this defining my types. The way I would describe it in like in business speak is like not being forced to define the full constructs of what you're trying to use. So if I want to read a JSON, an XML, a REST, or DB, or whatever, like I just want to read dot whatever. I don't want to like create another class file, what etc. And and I find it's funny because we used to have like these contracts for SOAP and WSDL definitions, and we used to define everything. And then we went to like REST, where we're like, OK, it's just a JSON, so call whatever you want. And now I'm seeing like Spring Cloud contracts being popular, where it's like, OK, well, let's put, let's verify all these things and like verify these contracts between the services. And it, in a way, I feel like check versus runtime exceptions is the same thing, where, uh, and I, I know this is like another argument. I've gone back and forth on checked in runtime. I found at the end of the day, like when you're writing a, a web app, um, I'm like, I don't want to like waste my time. Like if I if I want to like wait for, add a, like a wait for 1,000 seconds, I don't want to have to add like a catch interrupted exception. And usually I'll just have in my web app like some kind of generic exception handler. Uh, so I find like checked exceptions kind of add bloat. Um, they add extra code, but I found like all of them are less code but you're more explicit. Uh, it is It is more error prone. And testing was supposed to negate this. But you know what? Nobody write, writes tests. Tests get like forgotten about. And then you have like, you deploy into production. Oh, no pointer exception. Again, uh, alternatives. I, I did want to point out that uh, alternatives exist. People get very stuck on dynamic versus non-dynamic. Uh, for stuff like reading JSON XML, you can just use XPath or JPath equivalents. Uh, there's plenty of languages that have like, or like Groovy has optional typing, uh, where I could, yeah, just stylically type as much as you want. But then if you don't know the type because you're reading JSON, just dynamically type it. Uh, there is an upfront velocity improvement. 
Um, I do see startups. I know Twitter originally wrote their back end with uh, Ruby. Um, I think so did Shopify. But then they all, like, both of them ran into problems. Um, the long-term maintenance costs are substantial, in my opinion. I would say, like, minimize it. Like, even for JavaScript, like, the amount of times when I've, like, worked with React.js and they just randomly get uh, null pointer exceptions or whatever in production because somebody forgot to check for null or it was the wrong type, I would say if you could s stay on uh, static, do it. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. I forgot to add that there is, like, there is su there's substantial performance hits on, like, full, full dynamic, yeah. full dynamic. People, people rip into Groovy because it's like, oh, it's slow because it's, it's uh, uh, dynamic. But I'm like, well, no, if you statically type things and then, like, once in a while use dynamic, it's not a hit. But in general, there is a performance hit. Um, I forgot to add that. It's not a 2% performance hit. Pardon me? It is. Hit from my, and I'll, I'll quote our uh, one of our esteemed uh, hosts. Like the performance, it is is secondary. Static types give your tools superpowers. Oh, sorry, that that too. Uh, yeah, the refactoring, they able to. Yeah. Look, you guys. Look, look. I. You're, you're preaching to the choir. I said. Uh, I said like go static typing. Yeah. Go. So. <laughs> Discounting refactoring, it's the diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, when it fails at runtime in production, that's when. Oh, yeah. Because it will fail. Somebody will forget to, like. Yeah. The, this, is, this is exactly why I think, like, the biggest benefit of uh, Kotlin is the whole uh, uh, non nullable types out of the box. Like, that, like, it's not this other yeah, stuff. It's like. Like. Pardon me? Oh, that's Scala awesome. Look, that's. That, that, is, that is great. Uh, uh, oh yeah, this one. This one's fun because uh, this is Java group. <laughs> uh, but okay, but but to give you guys background, uh, okay, to give you guys background, um, like at, uh, like I'm a Java developer. I used to teach Java. Actually, if I had to pick a language to like do my own little coding in, it's typically Groovy. Uh, but I do have a lot of experience with C sharp, specifically on three five. Up to, sorry, up to the naming, sorry, the, the naming of the Visual Studio does is horrible too because there's .NET 3.5 and there's C Sharp 3, but they're the same, like, uh, but I, like I have a lot, of, I did a lot of coding in C Sharp. Things have drastically changed in the last three years, so I'm not fully up to date. I kind of follow in and out, uh, but I do kind of want to give my background from when I did use C Sharp extensively and compare it to Java. And look, at the end of the day, I think C Sharp and Java, like, let's be honest, like C Sharp is just a copy of Java with some other stuff ripped, thrown on. Uh, but it is, look, in general, especially with 3.5, pardon me? Yeah, I know, that's, uh, that's a great feature. But look, historically, especially when you look at uh, .NET 3.5, the language itself was more expressive. They had lambdas and like yield and uh, what else do they have? Um, runtime, generics. They had a lot uh, dynamic types. They had all this stuff a long time ago, way before Java 1.8. Uh, there was a lot of really nice syntactic sugar. Um, and, I, and I feel like this is where C Sharp developers are like really stuck on. They're like, oh yeah, but we have like, we have generic, uh, sorry, runtime, uh, generic checking, and like all this other stuff. But they really miss the big point, which is this, this very, historically speaking, this very lacking ecosystem, which is you're stuck on Windows, you're stuck on IIS, which is a big giant pile of uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Visual Studio and then TFS. Like, if, uh, like oh, who here has used Visual Source Safe? Because this was a long time ago. I had to use it once. Like, it, it's, it's literally better to use, like, just a shared folder mount <laughs> than to use Visual Source Safe as your source control. Like, that's how bad it used to be. Uh, NuGet is kind of like, pardon me? Uh, yeah, so clear case. Case. Clear case, uh, clear case was better. It was just really messy. Okay, uh, I, agree. I disagree with you. But anyways, Sorry. Visual Star Safe, uh, NuGet, um, the open source support was never there, and the cost too, because uh, to be fair, like ever since Steve Ballmer left, um, like things have gr drastically changed in, like, uh, in, the, in the Microsoft space. So you could actually, I could just install Visual, I have Visual Studio on my Mac without running parallels. I could install SQL Server on a Linux machine 
And there's .NET some Core, yeah. .NET Core you could run anywhere, whereas no, before you had to use yeah, it is. Yeah. So drastically changed. <laughs> it's a lot better. So I'm kind of talking about before. Uh, it's, it's so lagging in the cloud native space. There is no true like Spring Boot slash Spring Cloud equivalent. Um, you have Steeltoe, which is kind of there. Like Although whatever. the stuff integrates far better with Azure than it does with anything else. But yeah, you're kind of stuck on the ecosystem. And I think this is what happened because uh, so I used to live in Calgary, and Calgary, the oil and gas market, was very dominated by Microsoft. And what you see, and then this is where like these biases come in, and I see that everywhere where uh, Microsoft has a very strong sales force. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, like, every, like Pivotal has a strand, Salesforce, whatever. But in that market, it was, it was a Microsoft shop, and that's what people do, did. And I mean, like, at that time, Sun Microsystems, I mean, wasn't really like peddling Java. You should use Java. It, it was a Microsoft place, and that's, that's what was happening. Uh, actually, it was like. Yeah, uh, literally time. Yeah, it was just all .NET. Uh, I went to Prairie DEF CON a couple years ago, and more than a third of people there were using Windows Phone. <laughs> and Zunes. Oh, man. Windows Phone. Yeah, they probably got them for free. OK, but, but I wanted to ask a question. Can anyone name more than one startup, successful startup, that used .NET? Be more than one. More than one. That's why I said more than one. And I put it in Stack Overflow aside. Can anyone name more than one? Pardon me? Yeah, I don't know that one. <laughs> but, but I mean, you kind of have to, like, you kind of have to. Yeah. But look, the, the point is, like, this, in general, like, in general, like, startups won't go .NET. There's still costs associated with it. And actually, there's a great article, if you guys want to read another fun rant about uh, that. Th this, this, this went viral years ago, but, like, why we don't hire .NET, develop, .NET developers. And I would argue that there's, <laughs> there's some truth in it. But okay, but you guys are all Java developers, so that's fine. Uh, if you're going to use .NET, like you, you really got to factor in like the the market. I mean, like Calgary's a lot better. Uh, your existing code base, like your existing developers, in general, like unless you're programming for like Windows phones, and like I don't know who uses who uses Windows phone, or Zunes. Who uses Zunes? There's a lot of people in. Does, it, does anyone does anyone here not know what a Zune is? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've never seen then, one. The Windows app, Windows desktop app. Yeah, but OK, if you're using Windows desktop, but why are you writing desktop apps in the 21st century? Uh, there are still people who do it. Yeah, like, so like, if you're. I even touch on the biggest problem I've got with that, which is lack of visibility. Pardon me? When things go well, they go well. But when they fail, it's a So the cost of maintenance is super high. Uh, yeah, I want to. I want to believe that. It's, uh, I, used to, I used to work there. It's, uh, uh, but like, it, you need a good reason to go down that. You need a good reason, and and and, and and yeah, and sorry, going back to the like the biases and the self-interest. Like, I'm sorry, like the self-interest isn't just developers working on hype. It's also maybe like the middleman directors that's buddy buddy with some. Microsoft sales rep that's like, nah, yeah, OK, uh, well, uh, take me out for dinner a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, so it works both ways. But I'm just saying, like, this .NET should not be your default. Like, in general, you should not be using .NET. I'm sorry. Like, yeah. 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 Pardon me? Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Like anything, like if, especially if you want to, especially if it's like if you want to start hooking into third-party stuff, like I don't know AWS Beanstalk, or uh, or actually, oh sorry, and even the build scripting. People still use MS Build, which is the equivalent of Ant. Like literally, not people are or or WCF or whatever. Uh, the equivalent would be me. Yeah. Um, there is Ant for .NET and Ant. Yeah. Oh, and Psaki. That was the other one. Uh, but I get, uh, I'm going to skim through this because I want to like. We, we had a good counter question, which is can you list more than one startup using Spring? 
I can list more than one startup using Java. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But I Google. I, I was googling. I was googling .NET. Well, okay. AWS. AWS started off as Java Shop. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what they started off. As much as I'm a Scala guy, there are awful things about Scala. Yeah. I don't think the average team should be using Scala. No. It's yeah. a really yeah, look, interesting language to explore ideas. I didn't, ideas. I didn't say it's bad. <laughs> I'd say there's use cases. I'm, okay. I'm the guy saying it's bad. Uh, all right, I got 20 minutes. So I'm going to plow I through this. It's helpful in the it, it, it is bad. Uh, I, I can answer it, but yeah. your question in particular. <laughs> okay, because well, uh, I know, because I remember last time I got like kicked out because I ran out of time. How much time do I have? I probably got to eight o'clock. Oh shit, twenty minutes. Okay, okay, I'm gonna plow through these and then we'll do questions and answers. Pair program this is another interesting one. I've kind of went back and forth on this. To be fair, I don't think there's a clear cut answer, but I think a lot of people miss m miss the points. And look, cost, absolutely. Like, if I have somebody sitting beside me, I'm not going to magically start typing 300 words per minute twice as fast. Uh, I do see a little bit of design by consensus. We're just like, OK, well, yeah, we'll just do things the normal way. But I feel people miss what it really mitigates. Um, first of all, is ivory towers. It's like you don't, you don't have, like, it mitigates these these ivory tower tech leads are architects that just go up into their space and like throw random uh, buzzwords at you and then like disappear. Um, and they, they eliminate these knowledge transfers and information hoarding. But I feel the biggest one that nobody ever talks about, and this is kind of why I've went back to pair programming, like, oh, this is a really good idea. Uh, is, does anyone want to guess this? Nobody wants to okay. talk about this. Pardon me? Uh, yeah, you're close. It's just like this highly focused development and this minimized distractions where like even when I'm coding, I'm like, I'm going to check, uh, check Stack Overflow. Nah, I'm going to ponder the world. Uh, but uh, like I find like hardcore, because we did at ThoughtWorks too and at Pivotal, but like six hours of pairing, like you're going to get exhausted. You're going to get a shit ton of work done. Um, uh, give it a try. And I will say like me, like if, if I'm ever like working with you and like, uh, like I, like I know now I'm a little bit more architecty, and like I'll be fairly transparent that my JavaScript sucks. I've forgotten a lot of keywords, sorry, uh, hotkeys in IntelliJ. Like I'm slower now, uh, but I feel like I add value on the higher level stuff. Uh, but it, it does take a lot where you're like you're at a more senior level, and you have to like pair with junior developers that somehow like code 200 words a minute, and like letting go of this ego, which is why like I will like if if, if I'm ever working with you like. I, I will say, like, if you want to pair with me, go ahead. You can pair with me. I will pair with you. And then even then, if I say, like, OK, well, this time I'm not going to pair with you, like, I'll pair with you. Like, kind of like that. Uh, has, has anyone, like, does anyone remember, like, in Fight Club, where, like, Tyler Durden says, like, even if I tell you not to do it, uh, do it anyway, or, like, I'll or chop off my balls type thing? Like, it doesn't, like, it, whatever I do, <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like pair program. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but like even if, if even if I say okay, I'm not going to pair with you. Like I'll pair with you. It doesn't matter. Like it, it's this letting go of the ego. Uh, give it a try. But I, f I find the problem is um, it's almost always all or nothing because it always drops to zero or you have to mandate it because people are always like just start getting lazy. I don't know what the right solution is, but the only ways I've seen it is it's almost zero. Or it's like almost completely mandated, which we do at Pivotal. I have some experience with that, and I think the trick at like Pivotal and ThoughtWorks is it's a it's a filter on hiring. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people, a lot of respect, maybe even people in this room who do not pair well, or, you or who do not, not want to pair. Oh yeah, it's an ego thing. If you if it's a filter on hiring, um, then you end up with people who pair well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which means you can't mandate it at a company that didn't filter for hiring. That's that's the corollary. Like when you say the mitigates of the average average knowledge silo information hoarding, isn't like a good PR policy enforcing PR and whatnot? Like it's not all. Uh, you know what I find of PR is like. 
people just like it, it becomes like bike shedding or people are like uh, dude you missed a, your semicolons off but they like they don't really i find with prs people just kind of skip the fundamental the stuff Yeah. I found not all of our PRs, but I, I would say at least three or four times a week I get a substantive comment on a PR that yeah. makes me go and change it. I don't know. I like I this is like an in general thing. Of like course. I've seen no, I, 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 and like I, But I, I find it comes you automate the you have a standard for yeah. how close with the look and what have you. Oh yeah, I, I, I yeah, I totally do that. Then they can bitch at you for But I like I've totally wasted time of like uh I mean, the first one, like, I kid you not, this was a year ago, I remember one developer spent an entire day trying to prove to me why you need to use constructor dependency injection. And like, <laughs> wrote up like this, this big giant essay and email, and I'm like, look, who cares? Like, and this, this is where I find like code reviews, uh, like non-real-time non code reviews can suck up a lot more time where people like do the research, in general, um, as opposed to two people doing one two people. Yeah, look, look, this is why this is why I say like give it a try. Uh, I, I went back on uh, fourth in it, and I know. Uh, look, I, I know sometimes, sometimes, especially if it's trivial stuff, or if I just need to hack something together. Like I don't want somebody sitting beside me. I just want to hack something together. Um, but in, look, in the corporate world, I would say just give it a try. Uh, pardon me? Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I've tried it out. It's, it's like a nice little fun thing to do at lunchtime. Uh, oh, yeah, automated tests. Yeah, like every, everyone should be doing automated tests, right? Like 100% toast coverage, right? Right? So anyone? Pardon me? Okay, what I specifically want to call out, call out. Oh, yeah, I got, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, <laughs> what I specifically want to call out is two things, is this granule mock heavy unit testing and this BDD style cucumber test where you're adding like an extra layer on your test to make things more English. Uh, yeah. Then your product manager can write tests. <laughs> exactly. Let me get to that. Let me get to that. Uh, made that no one ever talks about these costs. Uh, you get into these mock heavy testing frameworks, people Refactoring becomes impossible because you're, te you're testing the inside pieces, uh, which I'll give a demonstration in the next picture. And people just forget, like, they're like, well, I'm not going to refactor this because it's going to break 10 tests. Uh, so people just stop refactoring. Um, you're really testing the plumbing instead of the business value. And I know, like, Marcin, who gave a talk here on Spix Sleuth, I saw him post on Twitter, and he, because uh, he was saying how, uh, Makito has to be one of the best tested frameworks in the world right now because everyone uses Makito and it's testing Mokito instead of actual business value. <laughs> uh, this additional layers, like I'm sorry, like, like if somebody wants to argue with me about this, uh, sorry, Selenium, I should have said Cucumber. I actually, I love Selenium. Uh, it, was, it was a typo. But uh, Selenium's awesome. Uh, but these Cucumber style tests where you, you write this extra layer, it's not JUnit 5 or Spock, it's you write this other stuff that's, that the BAs are supposed to write for you, <laughs> and then you write, you, write, uh, you write this transcription code that maps it into JUnit. Guess what, like BAs are never gonna write code or like open up source control or Git. They're never gonna know, like figure out how to use Git. They're not gonna do it, like stop this two layer stuff. If you write the right abstraction, if you use something like Spock or even JUnit 5, which is out now, it adds some really cool stuff where you can get really close to that, to like almost English when you're defining your tests. Uh, yeah, and alternatives exist. I'm a huge fan of like smoke tests, uh, like really drilling into like where my return on investment is and integration tests. And I know like integration tests or like component tests, it gets thrown around. But what I mean is, uh, and, and to end at like the component level. So I need to write a service. Okay, the service, uh, when I call this endpoint with this text, it's supposed to write persist this item and then return this. Well, I'll write a test that says when I call this endpoint with this thing, it's going to persist this thing and return this thing. So it doesn't matter how much I refactor, uh, my test still passes as long as I have the same functionality. And also this trend that I've been seeing where 
uh, of investment in the industry, especially in like the giants, where it's like the investment is a little bit more on like detecting issues as quickly as possible and almost admitting that like, look, p people think that like, <laughs> people think that 100% test coverage means you're gonna have zero bugs. That's not true, you're always gonna have bugs, things are always gonna break. So w the trend that I've been seeing is like, how do you detect things right away? How do you put alerting in place, monitoring in place, that if something breaks, you could roll things back, roll things back right away, zero downtime, et cetera, uh, instead of just trying to be perfect in goal planning or tests. Yeah, uh, exactly. And then, oh yeah, what about TDD? Uh, I kind of gone back and forth about this as well. There's some. Uh, there's a really good example online with, with somebody trying to do TDD Sudoku, and it just becomes a mess. And I think the mess in TDD becomes when you try to do it mock heavy unit tests where you're spending all your time mocking everything out and doing like mocking factories and object factories and all the stuff instead of like, look, there's nothing wrong if you get a business requirement of uh, this rest endpoint with this text call needs to return this. Like just, sure, put the text fall in, save it, create the test, do it before you write the code or after. They're both fine, I'm not gonna. Uh, focus on ROI and, and delete, oh yeah, and delete questionable tests. I, f I, f I feel like uh, business kind of like, there's this metric around like, oh, we have 100 tests, so that's better than 50, <laughs> so it's more safe. But then what, what eventually happens when you get into these mock heavy unit tests, and especially the cucumber test, is things just start failing randomly. Test DK. Test DK, and then it's the whole broken window fallacy where then like, ah, two broken tests, that's fine, that's fine, don't worry about it. Two, Two, three broken tests, don't, don't worry about it. No, just like delete them. If they're breaking all the time, just delete, don't put ignore on them, just delete them. And, th and, and this is what I meant by like this, this testing, internal plumbing testing, like this is a Rube, Rube Goldberg machine. It's this useless stuff that I see all the time. Like if I wanna wipe my face with a napkin, I wipe my face with a napkin. I don't like set up these clocks and like, I don't know, what is it, uh, like a parrot and like some, uh, piece of bread, and then I don't write test saying that if the piece of bread flips up to the carrot, uh, sorry, to the parrot, the parrot will eat the carrot, uh, sorry, the, the bread, and then go down. Like, I don't write tests for that. I just write tests for if I lift my spoon, I wipe my face with the napkin. Like, even if I want to, like, waste my time with all the silly plumbing, w maybe for performance reasons, okay, imagine the parrot's a Redis server or whatever. But look, uh, just write your test for like, I wipe my face with a napkin. That's, that's what I'm, and, and I want to get into Spock. I'm, I'm a fan of Spock. I don't know, to be honest, because uh, the future of Groovy is kind of uncertain, but I do find even with JUnit 5, which has made things easier to read, I do find Spock and I encourage developers to like, look, stay on the Java stack, eh, don't go Groovy for your st standard code. But if you want to write like clean tests, instead of using Cucumber, write something, use something like uh, Spock, which I find is a lot more legible. You're getting really close to, to business speak. Um, and this is just an example. I mean, like uh, the one on the left in particular I love where you can get like parameterized inputs. Um, and then it'll actually create, f like the test on the l left will create three tests. And then in my test report, it will show three tests for data drive test minimum of three and seven is three, et cetera. Uh, you could also inject like, it's really easy to inject text files. Uh, there's a lot of really nice syntactic sugar, which kind of gets you to what like BAs always want, this cucumber stuff. Uh, oh yeah, this one, this one, this one uh, I find is also controversial. All right, common code bases, everyone loves reuse, right? Yeah, really code reuse. I'm gonna focus on this stuff internal frameworks, internal ORMs, custom platforms, custom testing libs, custom common libs. Uh, I see this all the time where developers are like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna, I don't really like uh, Lombok or Apache Utils because it, you know, the performance, the performance isn't quite there and uh, you know, it has all this blow. I'm gonna write my own common libs and then everyone could use it and then everyone could like, we could save velocity, right? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a horrible idea, but uh, learning curves for developers, dependency on current developers, they stick around for two years. Uh, you're not writing actual business value, maintenance cost, multiple repos, how are you gonna do the CI stuff? Like, and I'm sorry, every single time, okay, in general, 
anytime I see these common libraries, they're not going to have proper tests. They're not going to have CI. They're not going to be like really thought out for day two. And those developers are probably going to leave in two years. And there's alternatives. Um, and the one that I, I the one that I kind of see uh, uh, when I was reading, I think it was the fall Fallacies of Software Development book. Uh, they talk about like if, if you're seeing code reuse between at an application level, like just embed it the first three times and then factor it out. What I, instead of what I typically see is where you have these common utils, but only one application use it, uses it. So I mean, like just stuff it in your like either if a third party tool exists. Uh, often open source, like Lombok or Apache Utils, whatever, which, look, I'm sorry, like it's almost always better documented and better supported. Use that one. I understand that the, there's maybe like you get into edge cases, whatever. If, if, it, if it's not there, the first time just embed it. The second time it embed it. The third time embed it. Okay, and then, like, okay, now I'm going to step back and, okay, maybe we should like factor it out. and create our own like uh, CI pipeline for it so then somebody could push code for it, like document it well, then do it. support it as an actual open source library. Yeah, Don't pull it as a library. exactly. Uh, and, and true story, this, this happened to me. Uh, somebody uh, at a place I worked at uh, in, insisted on using their own common utils package. And then, uh, then they took off after I kid you not two years ago. Two year, oh, and to make it worse, this was uh, Node.js and the way no, yeah. Uh, there's this practice, and this is a horrible practice. When you deploy code in Node.js, often what people do is they don't build a jar file or a zip file. You publish your code, and then on your Beanstalk instance, whatever, it runs npm package and pulls down the dependencies. So what happened, true story, is we, uh, we were working at this place. Developer left. He wrote this cool little common, common library. Um, and we, and an, an auto scale event happened where uh, Amazon Beanstalk sp spun off an extra instance of the application. So it, it did the npm install, and then it was like, okay, well I have these dependencies. Go pull them down. I'm sure, they're all available. One of them was this common thing, which got deleted, and it just took down pod. Uh, and then not not to mention, pardon me. Oh no, left shift is a separate story. <laughs> but this is a common one. Uh, I mean, so I'm sure. Moral of the story is use fat jars. St stif stick, <laughs> stick everything in your jar and don't use like default to not using common uh, base jar gradle. Yeah, that's why we're all here, right? Uh, benefits, easier to read, no XML, less lines of code, absolutely. Easier to extend. Um, I find with Maven, people get into like, they start adding bash scripts for random things. Like, I don't know if they have to deploy to Beanstalk or Cloud Foundry, whatever. They start adding these bash scripts, and then you're screwing over the Windows developers, because there still is people that use Windows. I know. Or you do what you're supposed to do with it, which is create a plugin, but then you're. But you're not going to create a plugin. You got to create a Java file. Yeah, uh, it is easier to extend, and uh, there, there's plenty of situations where I have to do something, like something as simple as I don't know, creating a binary with my source code or deploying it. Amazon or like random things you got to do. But I would say the biggest selling point is the build time improvements. And these are X factor. Uh, these are X factor improvements. And I, I find it goes up, especially the bigger your project is. There's a lot of things that Gradle does behind the scenes. And we're not talking about like, oh, 5% improvements. Like I've seen 10 fact, like 10x build improvements on build large scale projects. And like I'm, I'm going to discussing people with this afterwards. but. Uh, this is a huge time saver, especially on bigger projects, whether it's CI or local builds, where you don't get stuck in the whole, I uh, was the uh, XVCD picture of like, oh, my code's compiling, so I'm going to dick around and do nothing. Like, if you could cut your build times from 10 minutes to one minute, if you factor things out, like if, if you take into account that like, you know, maintenance, most of your time is going to sp be spent on maintenance. If you look things, we look things at it like in the next five years of how much that nine minutes is going to save you. Like that's huge. Uh, but I'd say like at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to this political capital thing. Uh, is it a huge benefit? I mean, like if you don't have a build big project, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but use Gradle. Uh, this is another one that I've been seeing a lot. 
uh, multiple source code repositories, right? Like, oh, what's wrong with multiple source code repositories? And I want to focus on this thing. It's where you have the same team and the same deliverable. And for, for whatever reason, people, people mention these words like, uh, I don't know, loose coupling and like separation of concerns. And they're like, oh, we're going to have like, oh, yeah, oh, that's the next slide. That's, that's, ah, let me rant. I'm going to rant about that. But like, it's where you're, you have one deliverable that you only ship once a week, that everything's self-contained, but you insist on like splitting up into repos. Committing becomes an issue. You can't like atomically commit between the stuff. The CI, CD overhead, now you've got to like have multiple builds instead of, uh, like, and then you've got to combine them through pipelines, but that never happens, so everything's manual. Local development, I can't just check out a repo. I have to like check out two repos now and like connect them up together. Uh, and it, like what would Jesus, sorry, what would Google do? Like Google actually has like a mega repo. Um, <laughs> well, no, no, but this is the context. This is the context of like, this is why like, like what do you, uh, like Net Netflix does certain things because of scale, but yeah. the, the repo thing isn't because of scale. Like it's. I disagree. Yeah. In part it is. There's huge Google, cost. Google is able yeah. to basically yeah. say, we will take every open source project we use and fork it. Oh, shit. Uh, I'm Most gonna, of the software don't have that luxury. All right, I'm gonna uh, apologize. Um, let's let's talk after this because I want to skim more. microservices. Oh man, this one, this one. Uh, I got two more, but the next two are gonna get fun. Uh, look, monoliths. The problem that I see in the corporate space is you get these these tumors that just keep growing and growing and growing, <laughs> and you get like 10 developers, 20 developers, 30 developers, 100 developers working on the same application that takes two hours to compile, and then like has six month release cycles, absolutely, like that's bad, don't do that, split things up. That's not what I'm arguing for. I'm arguing for where people prematurely, because I saw an article, Deloitte, uh, I'm gonna call them out because we have no official, uh, there was an article that I read the other day where it said microservices should have no more than 100 lines of code. I, look it up, look it up. And 80% and test coverage. Uh, and 80%. Uh, there's, there's, there's huge, uh, anytime somebody says microservices, just point out, like I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. I, I totally think there's benefits. Uh, one of the guys I worked at at ThoughtWorks, Fred George, some great videos about it, absolutely. There's some very serious costs that people completely ignore. Transactions, versioning, resource costs, performance. Uh, I know with dist distributed transactions, I've literally been told, no joke to my face, like, oh yeah, microservices, just don't do transactions. Like, I'm sorry, like that might work for Facebook where the occasional message might get lost, but at a bank, um, that it's doesn't work. Mongo <laughs> but Mongo's web scale. Okay, but uh, uh, who wrote this? Um, Uncle Bob, not Uncle Bob, uh, Fowler. Fowler wrote a great article about uh, you must be this tall to use. If you don't have DevOps, if you don't have like one click deploys, zero downtime deploys. If you don't have any of this stuff thought through, just forget it. Don't talk about it, just stop. Uh, and there's, there's alternatives. Uh, another guy from ThoughtWorks, Paul Hammond, look it up. He did a great all article about cookie cutter scaling because everyone always says, ooh, microservices scale better. No, there's alternatives. Cookie cutter scaling is you have a monolith and just scale it out instead of like granularizing everything. Um, you could decouple and have loose coupling at the code level, it doesn't have to be separated by a network interface uh, and address the fundamental issues first. Monoliths are not evil and they could scale and cleanly uh, separate and decouple code. Uh, and default, I almost feel like we should get away from this microservice. It should be right, right sized service. Like pizza default, I'm not saying that's, it could change over time, but default to like, a deliverable that's of pizza team sized services, which uh, I think came from Amazon, where they talked about like you have a, a team that eats a pizza team or something. I don't know. Uh, Kubernetes? No, 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 it comes back down to the cost. Uh, yeah. What, is the, what are you saving by breaking this up into its own repo and deploying it up here? Loose coupling. Loose cu you get loose coupling. <laughs> loose coupling. Given, the, given knowing a few people from Amazon, be very careful. Okay, uh, I, think, right I think we uh, 
Uh, Kubernetes, this one's great because I feel like it's at the peak of disillusionment right now. Uh, and also container orchestration service. Look, it's a great solution, especially where you're at. Like if you're, and I also say Docker Swarm or Docker equivalents, but like what are you comparing it against? Are you comparing it like you're bare metaling, like buying your own machines and putting things on? Or are you comparing it to infrastructure as a service? Or are you comparing it to platform as a service like Heroku or Beanstalk or PCF that's been around? Uh, like Heroku platform as a service has been around for 10 years now. If you're comparing it to IaaS, which is like what you get with like vSphere or EC2, absolutely, it's great. It gives you a lot of great stuff. OS abstraction, availability. If something goes down, it'll spin things up for you. Freaking awesome. If you're stuck on an IaaS, go use Kubernetes. It's the cool thing right now. All the cool boys are doing it. But don't run it yourself. Don't run it. Uh, yeah, use Pivotal. Uh, PKS. Lower level of abstraction than PS. Look, it's, it's a lower level. Like, uh, this is where people get stuck. I'm like, and it's so funny because the stuff like Beanstalk and CF and Heroku, platform as a service has been around for like a long time and Kubernetes just came, became popular a year ago. People completely forgot about this platform as a service stuff where I could just literally take a jar file, deploy it to Amazon Beanstalk or Cloud Foundry. Here's my jar file, run it, check mark auto scale, done. Instead of worrying about networking, ingress and egress, build packs, defining a pod, defining a Docker file, de defining persistent storage, and all this, all this stuff. So just stick to the highest possible abstraction. There's some really awesome use cases for Kubernetes. It's definitely better than IaaS. But if you could just stick your thing in a PaaS, just stick it, to, stick it in a PaaS. And, and I know, and I think the problem with PaaS is because it's, it's so simple, there's so little investment that people don't, uh, I've, I've never met somebody that's like super religious about PaaS, because it's like, because it's literally like, to learn how to deploy to Beanstalk or Cloud Foundry is like CF push, that's all you have to do. So there's no investment, so people don't get opinionated. Uh, well, you have to design your app correctly, cloud native way. Don't have state. The main thing is the state. Uh, but I find the Kubernetes side is a lot more investment. But if you could get to that higher level of abstraction, do it. Uh, oh, yeah, this one. I have one more. What about only containers? Uh, well, PaaS typically has containers under the scenes. Heroku had containers. Like, under the scenes, Heroku and PCF have containers. But it's, it's kind of like registers and memory management. Like, if I don't have to deal with it, then don't deal with it. Just, like, have it behind the scenes. But I don't want to deal with Docker files and containers. Actually, Beanstalk. Beanstalk. Amazon Beanstalk, which is AWS's PaaS, is actually not container-based, which is why it's so slow. It actually creates an entire operating system. Nice fun fact. Uh, yeah, but they only charge you for the EC2 instance. Reactive programming this is the other new one on the block. And like trying to figure out, like trying to define what this means in one sentence uh, took me forever. I think Microsoft's definition was like asynchronous stream with links and non-blocking, and I'm like, there's so many different definitions. I'm still, I'm, to be fair, I'm still trying to figure out. I think I have a pretty good grasp, but at the end of the day, it's like this, this really going for this non-blocking. Like, sp I'm, I'm really going to focus on the Java world with Web Flux and Java, sorry, Spring Boot 5, and what they introduced with Monos and Fluxes, which is a horrible name, because it makes me think of it. OK, five minutes. How much time do I need? Uh, just really quick. OK, five, yeah. mi five minutes. OK. OK, uh, it's a performance optimization at the end of the day, cost, deep learning, legibility testing. C performance gains, oh yeah, I've seen some great benchmarks where if you have 1,000 concurrent users and 1,000 threads, Webflux is now faster. Like, great. Like, how many of your apps have 1,000 concurrent users? And maybe that's an indication of your underlying database being slow or something. And actually, on the Spring Boot uh, 5 website, they actually say that on low usage, it's slower. Uh, and limited support, like to really get the full benefits, and I could talk to people about this afterwards, the solution needs to be end to end. Because uh, this is where you really get the benefits. Where, like the real benefits is the, the responsiveness, where you don't have to like have send these big giant chunks of data, and you could just s send smaller bits of data. Uh, but you need an end to end solution. And, Guess what? SQL doesn't support uh, reactive programming, only MongoDB, but MongoDB's web scale. Uh, positive market trends, sure. 
Threads are not bad. Like, I don't know. I, I saw a deck somebody present the other day. Somebody said threads are evil. If I opened up my system profiler right now, there's probably th like 500 threads on my machine right now. Like I saw yesterday, Safari, Chrome had 40 threads with three tabs. I don't know what they do. Like threads, <laughs> threads are not evil. They're not bad. Um, if you have to get into Reactive, like, like what are you doing? Like these are huge costs. These are really huge. Like, are you really trying to optimize that one node? Yeah, like, uh, and I'm sure there's use cases. Like I know, I know some of the developers and like, they're used, but should this be your default? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I actually, no. I'd say don't don't make it your default. I forgot the most important thing, which is the victim blaming. When a reactive app throws an exception, <laughs> you only see the thing that failed, and you don't see the thing that caused the failure. Oh yeah, like it's Unless the testing, the legibility. You know what? Like yeah. uh, I think the MongoDB or the the Node.js video with the puppets. Uh, made a great, uh, th they made a great comment in about like, look, synchronous code is the code you could read. This a asynchronous stuff. Because I wanted to like concurrent rest calls. Like if I had to call two concurrent calls right now in Spring Boot, what would I do? Pre Webflex. Can anyone guess? I mean, the easiest way that I could think of is you just have an async call and then you wait for both of them to finish. I mean, it makes sense. Okay, maybe future doesn't really, uh, whatever, but I, I think anyone that doesn't even understand like this future thing would I think they would kind of get get it get what's going on, but then with mono, it's like okay, well I'll create this this mono thing and then convert it to another mono, which is in a flux, which is something else, and then zip it, and then do this other stuff. Like I, I don't know, like I would love for somebody to be able to convince me that the second example is somehow more legible. Uh, like more English speak, and then also like performance improvements. Uh, Akka's at the bottom. Uh, like it, it's it's interesting that the Java parallel streams. And again, these are metrics, but like <laughs> just random googling that I found of hard metrics. It's like regular Java streams are often the fastest, especially if you use like parallel. Uh, buzzword pop. Oh yeah, this okay. This is gonna be the last one. Uh, buzzword pop for we because this is the 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 big one that I see on the radar right now. Uh, I want to see if anyone's going to get this. What do you get when you add uh, microservices, reactive and non-blocking programming, no, no SQL, SQRS, and event sourcing, Scala and ACA, and a freaking manifesto for good measure? Venture capital. Uh, a lot of venture capital. <laughs> ah, you get this thing. Does anyone know what Legume is? <laughs> Great, uh, new reactive microservice framework from the Ivory Academic Towers of light, uh, TypeSafe Lightbend. Um, holy shit, like this is, like if you wanna add risk to a company, uh, use this thing. I still haven't figured out, I've played around with it, I haven't figured out the benefit. Like there's buzzwordy benefits, I'm sure there's use cases, like I'm totally sure that there's use cases. Uh, being burned on Scala, I'm kind of less hesitant. I would say like use it if you can prove, if somebody could actually prove with hard metrics that it's, that there's some benefit, but instead of getting, uh, I think there's a future, but not right now. Uh, other items, I'll, be, I'll talk about these. Uh, th this is my summary of other stuff, because uh, I know I got like two minutes, but I'm willing to talk about them later. Tabs versus spaces, doesn't matter. EJBs, is anyone still using EJBs? Yeah, no, yeah, some. Uh, IntelliJ versus Eclipse or versus NetBeans, just use IntelliJ. Optionals, horrible mess. Server side versus client side. There's way too much push on client side nowadays. There's so many things that server side is easier for, including testing. Uh, like client side apps, like single page apps, React.js, Angular. They have use cases, but it's swayed way too much in SPA recently. React versus Angular. Uh, Angular gives you some really nice TypeScript stuff, static typing. Uh, 10x developers, uh, I think it's, it's actually wrong because I found developers that have negative productivity. They do more damage than they produce, so that, like, I, f I feel like 10x developers is wrong. OOP, functional, procedural, I think it's a moot point. OOP was supposed to be a big, say, like, big productivity improvement, so was functional, eh. Uh, branching. 
Uh, yeah, use, uh, use trunk-based development. Like feature branching is so passe. Uh, CPU thread optimization. Uh, in general, I see way too much developer time focusing on CPU optimization, where the bottleneck is rarely that. It's typically your backend or caching or using a content delivery network about like 20 different things instead of the CPU and the thread optimization. And guess what? Like, uh, I mean, the other big thing was people were talking about like, oh, yeah, we're going to have 100, 100 CPU cores 10, 15 years ago or whatever. Like, first of all, <laughs> your typical Spring app is still multi-threaded. It just serves different requests uh, differently. Um, with virtualization and containerization, sure, you might have 32 cores, but it's typically going to get split into 16 two-core machines. So it doesn't matter. Uh, immutable types and final and everything. Uh, key points, look, think big picture. Think the context. Um, don't just get stuck on this A versus B. It almost always depends on the context instead of like, oh, tech X sucks or tech X is bad, blah, blah, blah. Uh, rules are great for beginners, so pick the right ones. Like, there's nothing wrong with being with a beginner, a competent level. Um, just like I suck at cooking, like I need somebody to tell me how much salt to put into like my sauce or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, but pick the right ones. And I feel like some of them are bad. Like when somebody tells you that you have to write services, there are max 100 lines of code. Uh, I don't know if that's the right rule. So focus on this ROI, trade-offs, opportunity cost, maintenance, uh, do metrics. Think about like what your developer identity is, because I find like this is where people get biased. Uh, look. I love Groovy. I'm a Groovy developer, Java developer, but like my identity is like I solve tough problems and like I roll up my sleeves. I'm not like only uh, technology X. I will only work on I know Kubernetes and Groovy, etc. Uh, I'll really think big picture. Uh, technologies come and go. Uh, default to simplicity instead of Rube Goldberg machines, like that thing that I showed. Uh, three great book recommendations, um, highly recommended. Expert, beginner, which actually that's going to be the last slide, next one. Think Bigly, uh, it's the guy that did Dilbert, where he talks about persuasion and like how people think. And then rapid development, too, is kind of this high-level thinking. Uh, and then my last slide, before I get kicked out, uh, is I want to point this thing out because I do see this pattern. And this is why like if you guys are in tech lead positions or like maybe you guys are stepping out of tech lead into like less coding directorial positions. Has anyone heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect and imposter syndrome? Yeah. Uh, so you would think, because it's actual, actual ability on the bottom and then perceived ability on the left, you'd think that as the, the better you get, uh, your perceived ability stays the same, right? My experience, and there's a lot of like studies around this too, that's totally not true. And this is what I'm warning everyone against, uh, warning for is your beginners and your competence, they get to this level. And actually, that expert beginner book, highly recommend. It's very entertaining. But they talk about this, too, where uh, last slide. Uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, the people that I find that are the most vocal are usually like your expert beginners. They've memorized all the rules, and now they think they're the experts. And then like I find you get these imposter syndromes, people that start figuring out, they're like, holy shit, all the stuff that I learned, I actually know nothing. Uh, so they start thinking that like, oh my gosh, I don't know nothing. I'm horrible. But it's often these expert beginners that like talk the most and like convince everyone to use the right tools. Whereas you really should be kind of like looking at like listening to like these imposter syndromes, uh, guys, etc. But anyways, that's it. Uh, I'll be around. <laughs>